You gonna all fit there? <laughs> Welcome back. So in many of most of the discussions we've been having lately, the constant theme comes up. Also, it's come up during a lot of the workshops that Explore Mars and other groups have had when people ask, what do you think is the most challenging goal? What's going to be the most challenging thing before we can actually land people on Mars? Uh, most often, people will say entry, descent, and landings because we've only been, I mean, it's been, it was incredibly impressive uh, achievement to land Curiosity on the Martian surface, and of course, we have people here who were instrumental in that, but to get humans on the ground, we need to land considerably more. So I think that's why it's extremely important we have this panel here today to discuss this challenge, since if we ever want to get to Mars, we have to figure out how we're going to get on the surface and, of course, get back off. But so to lead this discussion is Andrew Keyes, you know, who's had an extensive career. I was looking at your resume and it was just many years, very impressive, and but is currently the center chief, uh, chief technologist at uh, Marshall Space Flight Center. So, uh, Andrew, you want to take over? Thank you. So it's a pleasure to be here. I am the Center Chief Technologist at Marshall Space Flight Center. Don't confuse that with the Agency Chief Technologist. There's 10 of us running around, one for each field center. Uh, Dr. David Miller is here at headquarters uh, and is the Agency Chief Technologist. So over the past couple of days, we have been listening to presentations on architecture. Uh, we've heard from several experts on Mars mission architecture design and analysis. There are many, many, many mission elements required to successfully execute a Mars program, but be it either crude or robotic, by the way, we can do either and both. Um, but one of the more common denominators across all of these presented architectures is the need for entry, descent, and landing capabilities. One of the not so easy pieces that you heard described yesterday. All Mars architectures require some method. All Mars architectures require some method of getting cargo and crew launched from the Earth's surface, transported across the void between Earth and the destination, then safely inserted into the destination's gravity well. Most of these architectures, but not all of them, require the inverse for a return trip. We heard about a few of those that are only going to go one way yesterday as well. Developing the destination and the architecture employed Depend, excuse me, depending on the destination and the architecture employed, EDL includes a wide variety of technologies and capabilities. The EDL list of technologies to be developed include, depending on the destination, supersonic deceleration, retro-firing propulsion systems, arc jet testing of materials within a relevant environment, computational fluid dynamics assessment of vehicle heating and pressure analysis, new engines and fuels for descent stages, new parachute designs, air capture or aero braking maneuvers, autonomous guidance capabilities for safe landing on hazardous terrain, and good old fashioned ablative thermal protection systems and heat, shield, heat shields. And that is not a comprehensive list. So as you can see, EDL comprises lots of different technologies that, are, that have a very wide variety of backgrounds. To discuss these concepts of EDL, I want to introduce to you uh, this panel of subject matter experts who will be able to further describe some of these technologies that I just mentioned and how they may fit within the planned architectures that we've heard about over the past couple of days. In assembling the panel, we attempted to provide a mix of participation from industry and multiple NASA centers. Unfortunately, I could not squeeze all the NASA centers who have anything to do with EDL onto the panel. In particular, I want to give a uh, recognition of Ames Research Center uh, with regard to their arc jet testing capabilities and EDL analysis and expertise. Uh, there are other centers that contribute, but as you can see, we already have a rather full table with the folks that we have up here now. Also, in comprising putting together this panel, we made considerations on providing a wide representation of many mission directorates within NASA, commercial industry and government, and different levels of technology maturation from things that are con conceptual and just being uh, discussed and investigated to things that have flight heritage. So with that, let me introduce our panel members. I'm going to go in the order that they will present. Ms. Michelle Monk is from Langley Research Center and possesses broad experience in orbital mechanics, trajectory simulation for planetary exploration, and technology development. 
She has worked at three different NASA centers over her 25-year career with NASA, including the Johnson Space Center, Marshall Space Flight Center, and the Langley, Langley Research Center. She has supported multiple Mars and human robotic exploration concept studies, worked on the Mars Odyssey mission's aerobraking operations, was the project manager for the in-space propulsion air capture project, was the deputy project manager for the Mars Science Laboratory entry, descent, and landing instrumentation, otherwise known as the Medley flight payload, and now serves as the Space Technology Mission Directorate, now serves the Space Technology Mission Directorate as the principal technologist for EDL technologies. John Olanson serves as the manager of the Morpheus Project. John is from Johnson Space Center, and uh, the Morpheus Project was established to create a flying vehicle testbed for advanced development of human spacecraft systems. Dr. Olanson began his career as a space shuttle flight controller, supporting 32 missions and logging over 4,200 hours in Johnson's Mission Control Center. He obtained his PhD in mechanical engineering with a biomedical focus as a National Instruments Fellow at Rice University. After completing his graduate work, Dr. Olanson returned to NASA to represent the astronaut office in the design, development, and operation of human life sciences experiments destined for the International Space Station. He has since held a number of positions of increasing responsibility, including assignments to the Office of Safety and Mission Assurance, the Shuttle Program Office, the Exploration Systems Mission Directorate at NASA Headquarters, and as manager of the JSC Engineering Planning and Control Office prior to his current role as the manager of the Morpheus Project. Dr. Mark Adler is the Low Density Supersonic Decelerator Project Manager at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. The Low Density Supersonic Decelerator Project is developing technologies required to enable landing larger, more massive payloads on Mars. At JPL, Mark was the Cassini-Huygens Program Lead Mission Engineer. He proposed the Mars Exploration Rover mission, and on that mission served as the mission systems manager, the landing site selection lead, and the spirit mission manager in operations. He also was the Mars Sample Return Chief Engineer and the Mars Sample Return Pre-Project Manager for two of its incarnations. John Brust manages SpaceX's civil sales effort. In his role, he focuses on deepening SpaceX's relationships across each of the NASA centers and identifying opportunities for collaboration. Before joining SpaceX, Josh worked as an aerospace engineer for the Boeing Company and as a management consultant for the Boston Consulting Group. Josh earned a bachelor's in aerospace engineering from the Arizona State University, a master's in aerospace engineering from the University of Washington, and a master's in business administration from the Harvard Business School. Mr. Adam Stelzner is a fellow at the Jet Propulsion Lab and currently the chief engineer for the Mars 2020 project. From 2005 until 2012, Mr. Stelzner was the phase lead for the entry, descent, and landing systems on the Curiosity rover mission. Mr. Stelzner was responsible for the technical success of the landing system development and mission performance. His work on Curiosity gave the phrase, seven minutes of terror, a whole new meaning. So let me begin by allowing our panelists to make their presentations. Michelle, you are up first. Thank you, Andrew. So I'm gonna give you just a little uh, overview flavor of some of the work we're doing in conjunction in particular with the human architecture team. Uh, you've seen a lot about the architectures over the last uh, two days. Um, and so I'll talk about that and the investments that we're making within NASA to um, help move us toward those architectures. Um, here is the Evolvable Mars campaign chart that you've seen a couple of times now. And so, of course, in uh, this particular session, uh, we're up here in the top right-hand corner on the uh, Mars surface path. And you'll see that, you know, obviously, entry, descent, and landing is an important part of that phase of the mission. Um, and so this uh, NASA-wide team that's been working entry, descent, and landing for several years has supported the uh, design reference architectures uh, through DRA-5, and now we're turning our attention to the Evolvable Mars campaign um, and the architecture and the payloads associated with uh, that particular um, architecture approach. So where have we been? Um, you heard and you'll probably hear a lot more from Adam about MSL in particular, but uh, when we think about entry, descent, and landing, um, 
as we uh, talked about yesterday, the United States is the only country that has successfully put landers on the surface of Mars. And so that um, obviously started back in the 1970s with the Viking 1 and 2 landers, um, followed by Pathfinder, um, and then MER, uh, Spirit and an Opportunity, uh, followed by Phoenix, and then Mars Science Laboratory most recently, uh, which was a great success and a superior achievement. Um, you can see how our rovers have grown in size and mass from little Sojourner rover um, at first up through our Mini Cooper sized uh, Curiosity rover. And so we've actually come a very long way in our entry, descent, and landing um, prowess over the past couple decades. Um, all of our landers to date have landed at fairly low altitudes on, on Mars, and that of course is because we have a very thin atmosphere. Um, to help decelerate us, unlike at Earth. And so uh, landing at low altitudes give us that little bit of extra time uh, to have some extra drag and density from the atmosphere to help land our payload safely. Um, but in the future, we want more global access uh, to Mars uh, to get to those interesting sites with the humans. You'll notice on this chart, uh, it shows that um, all these landers, these entry vehicles look kind of alike, and that's because uh, most of the technology development for these uh, was accomplished back in the 1960s and 70s in preparation for the Viking missions. And so we have used that heritage um, throughout all the, the missions that we've sent to Mars so far. So this is where we've been. And um, we want to see, obviously, if we can build upon that heritage moving forward. But um, I think we have a bigger problem. So here I tried to put to scale uh, the Mars Science Laboratory Curiosity rover uh, next to a notional concept for a human Mars lander payload. Uh, you'll see uh, quite a difference in scale, as we've talked about, but I thought a visual might help us. Um, you have a person over there on the side uh, for an extra scale. So we are talking about uh, human payloads that are 20 or more times uh, more massive than Curiosity, uh, five times taller, so we get into landing stability questions, um, and a 12 times larger footprint, so terrain and how we do our terminal descent and, and how we avoid big obstacles on the surface becomes much more important to us. So how are we going to meet this challenge? I've been requested several times by my bosses to try to put EDL on one chart. Um, it's quite difficult. <laughs> Here's my latest attempt, and uh, I have to credit Jeff Harris at Langley. We've been iterating on this for several months, but uh, this is our current version. I'm sure it'll be updated in the future. So on the left here, we have our uh, a current Mars EDL that I kind of explained on the previous chart with uh, all of our heritage up through Mars Science Laboratory. Um, and then on the far right, we have human Mars EDL. So we just saw the difference in scale that that's going to um, require. Uh, along the bottom, I've put the, the landed masses, so one ton to up to 15 or 30 metric tons. A precision, you know, MSL did fantastic on precision compared to the previous missions because we had hypersonic aero maneuvering. And that's definitely going to be um, required for the human missions, both for aero capture and for our entry, descent, and landing sequence. Um, but for the humans, uh, we're looking at a requirement right now of less than 100 meters. And that is uh, to emplace all of our cargo close together so that the astronauts don't spend a lot of time walking between elements. And it's also to get them in close proximity so that we might have to uh, hook them together in some way in the future. Um, and as I mentioned, we're going from about 40% access to the planet in terms of altitude all the way up to near global, perhaps, unless we um, down-select to our landing sites well in advance. So let me walk you through this chart. On the, uh, you'll see the timeline at the top. And so here we are in the green section in the teens here. And uh, it says EDL architecture selection. So the, the um, conflict that we have right now, or the challenge, is that we have a limited budget in space technology and obviously within NASA as a whole. 
And uh, if we have several options for entry, descent, and landing technologies, uh, we have uh, constraints on how long we can carry multiple options forward before we need to pick one and, as we've heard, stay the course. And so we're, we're in that green box right now where we're trying to mature technologies to the point that we can kind of give them a thumbs up or thumbs down and decide if those are going to be scalable and flexible enough to meet our needs in the future depending on where the architecture leads us. Um, so we have done some ground tests and, and some flight tests I'll show you in a couple minutes. Uh, we're heavy into systems analysis, um, trying to understand these systems well enough to model them and get good mass estimates and assessments of risk. Um, as we go into the 2020s, we'll be moving into performance and qualification assessments. So this will involve larger, more complex testing at Earth. Um, the question on the table today is whether or not we need to fly a demonstration mission at Mars to reduce the risk of EDL sufficiently for a human mission. And then obviously, uh, as we get closer to the, the 2030s, we'll be uh, actually qualifying this, the flight system. Now, along the way, obviously, this is not the only thing that NASA is doing. We have many other uh, projects and programs going on. We're leveraging Orion and SLS heavily in, in the Mars architecture. We also have science missions. And entry, descent, and landing is one of those cross-cutting uh, functions that needs to happen, not only for human missions, but for science missions. So in developing these technologies and trying to reduce the risk, uh, if we don't have the budget available to fly dedicated demonstration missions, one way to demonstrate these technologies is to use them on science missions. And so we've uh, been successful in trying to marry uh, the two purposes. Um, for instance, in the latest discovery announcement of opportunity, um, a particular thermal protection system material was incentivized. And we heard about this yesterday. Uh, where we told the proposers if they use this new technology, they would not be uh, graded down on a risk basis, and this could um, be outside the cost cap. NASA would provide this material at a, a sufficient maturity level for them to in, improve their missions. Um, and in the future, I hope we'll see many more um, incentives like this so that we can go ahead and get these technologies flown and demonstrated on missions that are going to destinations anyway. Um, so we in the EDL community serve both um, customers, science and uh, human exploration, and we're constantly looking across the aisle, so to speak, um, at common technologies that can work for both. And so uh, the main message here is that entry, descent, and landing is going to take a sustained effort. It's going to take um, sustained funding, as we've heard throughout uh, the couple days here. And it's a long-term endeavor. Even though entry, descent, and landing is a function that is really at the right-hand side of those charts in terms of time, and we kind of, you know, we go to Mars moons and we do other things so we, we can put it off longer. It's, Every time we roadmap this out, we should have started five years ago. So um, it, that story hasn't changed in my whole career. So we're, we're making some progress, though. Here is one notional concept of how uh, we might do an EDL sequence. Um, this uh, uses a blunt four-body aeroshell. This actual graphic is of an inflatable, um, a hypersonic inflatable aerodynamic decelerator. But we have other options, which I'll show you in a second. And so um, at Mars arrival, we will come in uh, hyperbolic and use uh, aero capture, perhaps, for the cargo. Uh, or we could do a direct entry. And so we're actually trading both of those uh, right now. Um, and that implies some things for the system. If you have to aero capture and then enter with your hypersonic decelerator, does it take a dual pulse? Do you take two of them? Uh, how, what, what impacts does that have on the architecture? So we're looking at those uh, performance metrics now. We go through the hypersonic phase um, of deceleration, and as I mentioned, we'll be maneuvering to try to get to a precise landing point. Uh, then we have to get rid of the decelerator, perhaps, um, and go into the supersonic phase, which we uh, plan to use retropropulsion to accomplish. 
and then the terminal approach and landing, uh, which obviously will be propulsive as well and get us down to that precise landing point. Uh, Space Technology Mission Directorate is looking, as I said, at several technologies uh, to accomplish the design or the reference architectures we're looking at now. Um, the, the top three, uh, the top row kind of shows you the hypersonic deceleration uh, options that we have on the table. Uh, the hypersonic inflatable aerodynamic decelerator is uh, a series of toroids that come out from a rigid nose. Um, that allows us to extend our drag area for uh, slowing us down in the thin Mars atmosphere beyond what is uh, the volume that is available in the SLS launch shroud. Um, the second concept is uh, called ADAPT. It's adaptable, adaptable Deployable Entry and Placement Technology. Um, same concept in terms of uh, increasing your drag area when you get to Mars. Uh, but this is a mechanical deployable covered with a carbon cloth technology and it's, think of an umbrella. So this is a, a different way to accomplish that increased drag area. And then we also have um, what has been the historical choice in the design reference architectures like DRA-5, what we call a mid L over D. I think in DRA-5 we actually called it specifically in something, you know, it's called an ellipse sled. Um, and that's something we haven't had a lot of active investment in, uh, but there is a, a technology demonstration uh, through CASIS and the International Space Station with a commercial partner, Intuitive Machines, um, and Johnson Space Center is working on that, and to see if that is scalable up to a, a human scale mission. In the bottom left, I mentioned the supersonic phase, so we're looking heavily at supersonic retropropulsion, and as we saw earlier, uh, today, um, we say that SpaceX has accomplished that in trying to return their, their booster to Earth. They fired uh, rockets at uh, around the same conditions we'll see at Mars, uh, around Mach 3 to 4, um, at particular dynamic pressures and densities. And so we are working with SpaceX in partnership to acquire their flight data and see if we can analyze um, the uh, performance of the SRP system. And then precision landing, of course, is important. And um, John Alanson is going to tell you a lot more about that, I'm sure. But we'll be leveraging the Morpheus and other test beds in the future to um, mature that technology. So in summary, NASA is investing now in uh, multiple concepts and multiple technologies for putting humans on the surface. Uh, we're uh, maturing the complex EDL systems is gonna take sustained uh, effort and sustained budget. Current studies are investigating the need for the Mars precursor mission as a demonstration uh, prior to taking the cargo mission all the way to Mars. And as we've seen, uh, we've talked a lot about political uh, context and, and other factors that are external to just the technical. Um, the choice of EDL technologies ultimately will rely on you know, our agency schedule and budget, how these other elements of the architecture progress if they come together on time, like the SLS, uh, the SEP, uh, other elements. Uh, the ability to perform cost-effective demonstrations or to utilize other NASA missions to demonstrate these technologies. And then I think it's really going to be important um, how the commercial sector plays into this. Um, personally, I think that we will not get the repeated flights and the reliability that we need unless we see these systems flying repeatedly uh, prior to the human Mars mission. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to John. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. All right, thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Andrew, for the invitation to be here. Um, I'm going to uh, kind of bring the focus a little bit uh, narrower in uh, my talk today. There's, uh, Michelle talked a lot about all the different areas of entry, descent, and landing, um, which are all important. And uh, what we've done with Morpheus is really focus on the terminal approach and landing phases. Uh, for, uh, for the testing that we've been uh, executing over the past four years. So I'll talk a little bit about that uh, discussion today. So Morpheus, uh, the project itself was about building a full-scale uh, robotic lander as a prototype for investigating human technologies uh, needed uh, for Mars, 
for the moon or other uh, uh, asteroid, wherever the destination is. Most of our activities are actually destination agnostic. Uh, and so they're still very applicable to Mars, driven by the Mars needs, um, but, but definitely can apply to other areas. Um, it includes uh, development of the, the, not only the vehicle itself, but all the systems necessary to fly the vehicle. So the ground systems, the operations capability, uh, all of those aspects. It was developed uh, at JSC, but we ended up with eight different NASA centers as partners uh, in the activity that we did with, uh, with Morpheus and All Hat. And I'll get into more details on that in a minute. Um, the technologies we were pursuing were really twofold. We were pursuing the pre precision landing that Michelle mentioned. Uh, the 100 meter driver, we took that as a requirement, a driving requirement for what we were trying to demonstrate um, and, and tried to focus on the, how we would deal with that from the terminal approach and landing perspective and how we would emphasize uh, being able to do that precision landing. Once you get actually too, uh, closer to the surface, you also, also want to work on avoiding whatever hazards might be on the surface. And so we had an integrated uh, autonomous landing and hazard avoidance technology, all hat we call it, and you'll see that on future slides. Um, there was a suite of sensors that would not only enable the precision landing, but also enable the hazard avoidance pieces uh, to, to enable the, that safe landing on the surface. And then we were also pursuing uh, LOX methane propulsion demonstrating it in a flying vehicle, uh, taking it out of the laboratory, which is really a lot of what the Morpheus project was all about, was about taking technologies that offer promise out of the laboratory and in integrating them onto a flying vehicle to demonstrate them as capabilities that we can actually employ in the future. A lot of our effort was really to reduce the risk to future programs by demonstrating these already integrated in a flying vehicle. Specifically supporting human spaceflight, uh, doing the Morpheus and All Hat uh, testing, the vehicle was sized. Uh, specifically, we had to have a reference mission when we started four years ago. We used a lunar reference mission to size the vehicle, could carry a 500 kilogram payload to the lunar surface uh, once we had gotten uh, translunar injection. So that, that just sized the payload, or sized the vehicle. Uh, the vehicle is scalable, however. Our whole design is scalable from robotic up to human. And that's one of the reasons we were choosing the architecture we did. Um, LOX methane propulsion, obviously you've heard the discussions about compatibility with ISRU. There's a lot of other uh, intangible benefits as well uh, with uh, LOX methane propulsion. The space storable capability of those uh, commodities, the commonality of components between those, uh, LOX and methane, as well as your ECLIS systems and things of that nature. There's a lot of commonality between components that can be uh, gained uh, in the whole overall system design. Um, there's also safety associated with, uh, with dealing with those propellants, which definitely was beneficial to us here on Earth in testament, testing uh, with the vehicle. And then the autonomous landing, we pursued autonomous landing in any lighting conditions, uh, enabled uh, precision. Michelle mentioned the 100 meter. Uh, that would allow you to approach whatever your landing site is and avoid, uh, again, to get uh, precisely there and then still avoid whatever uh, happens to be on the ground, whether it is rocks and craters or other pre-positioned assets that you want to avoid as well. So timeline, we, we've been testing, uh, started uh, about four years ago, started in 2010, I should say, and about eight months after we started our first initial design and development, we had a vehicle that we were testing uh, out at JSC uh, in, the, in the fields out there doing what we call the tether test where the vehicle was hung under tether. You'll actually see that. I got some video, video clips here in a minute. Um, we did end up losing a vehicle. Uh, two years in, uh, we, we lost a vehicle in a test out in Florida. Uh, eight months later, we were back up with another vehicle. Overall, uh, the time that we've been testing, four and a half months, we've developed three integrated flight vehicles, a number of different LOX methane main engines that we've been able to fly the vehicle with. Um, very low cost relatively across all of this. As a matter of fact, in the four and a half years that we've been uh, in work, the Morpheus project has only spent about $14 million over that entire time span. And that includes all development, all hardware, all software, uh, all, uh, all contract support. So um, uh, we've done quite a bit with, with that amount. Um, and as I've mentioned before, fully functional capability all the way through. So uh, our purpose, when we initially started was to try to, to uh, fly this trajectory 
again with a LOX methane propelled lander. We built, you can see off on the right hand side of this picture, that, that is a 100 meter square hazard field that's built off the north end of the shuttle runway. It's populated to match an area about central uh, latitude on the lunar surface where we took an image, we knew rock count, we knew all of those things, and we built up that hazard field to mimic that area. Again, it's a reference that we were using. It's not doesn't mean that it has to be only a lunar approach, but that was just a reference that we used. Um, so we built that up and we had the vehicle fly approaches to that hazard field to demonstrate not only the propulsive capability, but then the all hat uh, precision landing and hazard avoidance that I mentioned earlier. That mimics, this would be the lunar, I mentioned the lunar because we, we were using that as our reference. So our testing at KSC would mimic the approach phase as is demonstrated in this graphic here, as we're approaching that hazard detection and avoidance phase uh, through terminal descent all the way to touchdown. That would be lunar. From the Mars perspective, it's lower. You, um, Michelle had shown an earlier uh, graphic that showed entry. This is just another potential means of entry uh, to Mars. But again, we were just testing the, uh, the latter portions of terminal descent and landing with our tests. And I'm going to show a video because I've learned through all of these discussions, I've had people much rather see video than listen to me talk. So if we could actually bring the lights down a little bit, it'd be easier to, to see. I'll talk a little bit through this as we go, but this is the buildup of the, the Bravo vehicle, we call it. It's the second vehicle. Um, after we had, we had lost the first vehicle in August of 2012, within a month we had 70 design upgrades that we were implementing on the vehicle. Uh, new engine design, although the, uh, the actual injector, that's the new tank design, they were just testing the tank. Uh, but the, the injector uh, for the crashed vehicle, we actually recovered from the crash and it flew all of these tests. These were tether tests where we're actually just demonstrating vehicle capability out at Johnson Space Center before we put the vehicle at risk. This test, we actually uh, worked with JPL, that's simulant, the Mars soil simulant that we loaded underneath the vehicle with pressure sensors and demonstrated how it would respond to thrusters. And then we moved out to KSC and we started doing free flight tests out of KSC. For the first part, we're actually just demonstrating the vehicle performance, that the vehicle will actually fly as a stable vehicle. So we don't even have the all-hat sensors on board the vehicle at this point, because the all-hat sensors cost about three times as much as the vehicle did. This was a flight with the all-hat sensors on board. This was pre-flight 13 last May. You can see us rising above the shuttle runway, which is one of my favorite images from the testing that we did. But you'll see, we'll switch to a view from onboard the vehicle here in a second. And that's one of the all-hat sensors. It's a flash LiDAR that, that at this, uh, this altitude uh, is gonna start scanning. You'll see, the, it's, you'll see the gimbal start moving. It'll start scanning that hazard field. And so as we're approaching on a 30 degree glide slope into landing, we're at this point going about 30 miles an hour forward and that was scanning the field and autonomously identifying our landing site. Of course, we also had to demonstrate performance in any lighting conditions. Great audio video guys too.
Uh, we can bring the lights back up, please. Thank you. So that's just a kind of a summary. It's much easier to understand what it was we did over several years by watching the video, uh, I think. And so I think that's an important uh, demonstration of, of what it is we're able to, to accomplish within the project. This uh, graphic here shows all the different trajectories we actually flew. As you can see, we started small uh, and, and grew to where we were flying a full hazard detection phase, we call it, where the all hat system was on board and operating throughout the entire flight. Uh, so there's several, several um, tests we flew in order to get to that point, but then we flew six full uh, all hat tests. Uh, the all hat system was not automated, it was autonomous. So it actually, on its own, uh, would identify uh, all the hazards within that hazard field, uh, uh, find or select a specific landing site, and redesignate the vehicle to land at that landing site, and then those same sensors would be used to navigate to that landing site. Uh, so that's, that's how we were testing the all-hat system. Uh, performed extremely well. We were able to, through these tests, uh, bring it up to uh, essentially a TRL-6 level uh, with that system. So the basic advances that we had uh, for the technologies that we were pursuing. Propulsion side, obviously, you can see the vehicle fly. So we had an integrated system. Uh, there's been, there had been, and it's been talked previously in other talks about LOX methane um, uh, engine development work that has gone on, and there's a lot more that's going on today than even was a few years ago. Uh, these engines were all built, designed and built in-house at JSC by, uh, by civil servants. So we had a very small team, really, only about 40 civil servants on average, um, again, across eight centers. So relatively small for all of the different uh, vehicle systems. Uh, but we designed and built everything in-house just to, uh, again, for low cost, to be able to advance uh, the demonstration of these capabilities so that future programs know that they're available and can then incorporate them. Um, so with the LOX methane, we showed that we could run this vehicle uh, for, we ran it, uh, that engine, over 3,000 seconds of runtime, which is a lot of runtime for, for a rocket engine, uh, and uh, really had uh, a great performance all the way through. It's still in flight-ready condition. Um, we looked at, uh, uh, engine stability issues and, uh, and uh, things of that nature that we, uh, we were able to demonstrate. We looked at uh, differential draining. That's the purpose for having the four tanks, the quad tank configuration, so we could understand draining of propellants from, from different tanks uh, as we were flying. So we looked at, were able to look at and assess all those things. One of the most important things was we were able to actually tie the main engine and the reaction control system engines all together from the same source, feed them from the same source something that uh, previously was not considered feasible or viable, a uh, natural approach, but we were able to do it uh, very well uh, with Morpheus vehicle. And then from a precision landing perspective, there's obviously the GNC aspects of precision landing, the guidance, navigation, and control. You've got to get close enough with your, uh, your early entry aspects, what Michelle was talking about, uh, your hypervelocity hyper uh, uh, attitude adjustments or adjustments, right? So using trajectory adjustments. That, uh, that will get you on the right path. And then as you continue to approach using these sensors, uh, the all hat sensors to improve your precision capability, the, uh, for example, the, uh, um, the Doppler velocimeter that we flew is an order of magnitude improvement over any rate, uh, radar velocimeter that exists today. So there's, there's a lot of advances we're able to get out of precision landing as well, uh, including the hazard avoidance. Uh, so that's actually my last slide. I just wanted to end on the, uh, the advances that we're able to demonstrate uh, within Morpheus. Thank you. Yeah, Mark. Thank you. Okay, we can get the first slide there. It's stuck. Hi, we're talking about low density supersonic decelerators or LDSD. Um, it's not a combination of Mormons and hallucinogens. It is a um, development of decelerators to try and improve our landing technology, landing capability on Mars. We want to go to larger payloads on Mars. I'll talk a little bit about that. The, 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 the mention here of uh, 40 years, we've, as, as was talked about, the technology we've used to date has largely been based on Viking, which is uh, developments done about 40 years ago, or even a little more than 40 years ago. Uh, for our for entry system, for the descent system, for the landing system. We made a lot of advances on the, on the landing system. We actually made some advances on the entry system recently on, on different heat shield materials and guided entry. 
Uh, but we haven't really done much with the descent, so that's what I'm going to talk about. That's what these decelerators are mainly for. I'm still working on finding the right button here. There we go. So this is Curiosity. We landed this recently on Mars. It's about 900 kilograms. Uh, it was very nice and all, but um, uh, it's not a good enough, Adam. Um, we, need to, uh, we need to land bigger things. Um, we need to land them, as, as mentioned, uh, more accurately into higher altitudes. And so we're trying to advance our technology and descent to try and aid in those things. We want to go up to larger payloads, up to two ton, three ton payloads instead of one ton payloads in the future. And of course, as you saw on Michelle's slides, things that are much, much bigger eventually. Uh, as I said, the, we've developed, uh, done some technology development on the left there on the E part, the entry, and on the right on the L part on the landing. We've had lots of different landing systems. Um, we've had, uh, had some variations on the, on the uh, entry system, but on the descent, we've been basically using this technology, which is a, a disc gap band parachute developed by Viking on all of our missions from Pathfinder through Curiosity and planned for 2020 um, to, uh, to do the descent phase. And we've, uh, used, we've grown those parachutes, perhaps even a little beyond what they were qualified for for Viking, and we've kind of run into a limit there. So the problem we run into is, you know, is, you, is we can't just scale the systems up. Uh, you might say, well, just make the thing you made before bigger. Um, we run into a square cube law. Um, this is our basic equation. There will be a quiz. Um, this is the drag equation. And uh, as you can see, the, the main thing here is the area that you get your drag from. That, that's proportional to L squared. But the mass of your vehicle tends to be proportional to the cube, um, unless you make it really, really big and light. Um, and so we, we have this problem where the, the area over the mass tends to be about go like 1 over L. So the drag that you get, the acceleration you get from drag, goes approximately as 1 over the length scale. And so as you get larger, That's hmm? That's why it rains. Yes, Adam will tell you more about that when he talks. Um, and so the, this, uh, this, this gives us this problem where as we get to larger and larger vehicles, we have to somehow deploy larger areas in proportion to the size of the vehicle. And that's why we need these deployable decelerators to get bigger and more capable. So these are the things we're developing. I'll go through them uh, quickly here. We have our, what's called the SIAD r This is a supersonic inflatable aerodynamic decelerator, SIAD. And it is an inflatable device. It is made out of Kevlar. It inflates around the vehicle with built-in gas generators that are in the vehicle. It inflates to, in this case, to six meters, increasing the size of the vehicle from four and a half to six meters in diameter. That increases the drag area. This can be used at, at high speeds, Mach 4. In fact, we've tested it. I'll show you the test that we did recently. Um, which allows you to get the vehicle slowed down to speeds where you can deploy a parachute later. And so we need this first stage of deceleration as we go to these higher length scales, higher masses, in order to be able to get the vehicle slowed down uh, before it hits the ground, which is usually a good thing. Uh, and so you can deploy the parachute in time. Um, this, is a, this is an overview of, the, uh, of that SIAD. So you can see it's an attached torus. It also has a little burble fence out here to try and, uh, and break the flow off, make the flow, flow attachment more easy. Uh, more, more consistent. Um, it has several, uh, several uh, lines in it that hold the structure and is inflated to about uh, four, 4 PSI gauge pressure against the outside pressure. It shows the, it inflated on a test vehicle on the rocket sled track. I'll show you one of our rocket sled tests. And it inflates around the vehicle very rapidly in about a few, few tenths of a second, around half a second, in order to very quickly get to the right configuration and not induce any other dynamics on the vehicle. It's also very rigid. One of the things we wanted to get out of this, uh, this device was that it would, we would be able to simulate it with rigid models in, uh, in uh, ballistic range tests so that we wouldn't have to do more supersonic flights uh, in the long run to use slightly different shapes or different sizes on our, on our future vehicles. That, in fact, was successful. It is very highly rigid on the vehicle. The next one is a, a supersonic inflatable aerodynamic decelerator E. Um, this is, our, is a different configuration. It's called an attached isotensoid. You see it's quite a bit larger. This actually goes up to 8 meters instead of 6 meters. It doesn't weigh much more. It actually weighs about the same as the side R, so it's very efficient. It uses the same gas generators to inflate it, uh, but it doesn't, that inflation only gets it so far. The, the gas generators just get the thing out and open enough, but not at any kind of pressure, so that these air vents open up. And these air vents, you see, are facing down here. They face into the airflow. And that allows ram air pressure to inflate it the rest of the way and keep it inflated on the way down. So it's a little bit kind of a cross between a parachute and an uh, inflated, uh, inflated tire. And this is, this is, in fact, we just recently tested on the rocket sled track and, show, and shown that it actually uh, works quite well and has some interesting behaviors, too. Um, and just show some early tests in wind tunnels. And so this is our, our next technology for trying to get even larger payloads down the surface. This might be what we'd need to get on the order of three tons down on Mars uh, to, to slow the vehicle down so we can deploy a parachute. Now, once you've used these things uh, to slow you down to deploy a parachute, you still then need the parachute. 
Um, and in fact, the parachute has to get a lot bigger, because if you have a larger payload, now you need a larger parachute to get it to a similar velocity. And as I said, these things don't scale well. We don't have any real confidence that just because it worked at 11 or 16 or recently 21 meters, that we can simply scale that up and expect it to work at 30 meters. There are scale-dependent behaviors. There are behaviors even at these scales that we don't fully understand. And so we would like to do tests supersonically at full scale in the right environment, in the proper density and proper speed environment so that we can see the behavior of these things and get a higher, larger, higher performance parachute. In fact, this one's a different configuration than what's been used in the past. These are all disc gap bands on Phoenix, Viking, and MSL shown for scale. Um, this is a, a ring sail parachute that we're developing now for use at, at high speeds at Mars. Uh, at supersonic speeds, we can deploy it up to about Mach 2.5, we believe. It shows it in scale to a 747, so it's a very large, very large parachute. So now I'll show, uh, if we can turn the uh, lights down, again, the, the enemy aircraft searchlights, I think, can be reduced some there, and I'll start the videos. So this is testing the side. We do ground testing at the rocket sled track at China Lake. It's a couple hours north of JPL. They have this wonderful facility, a five-mile-long railroad, a four-mile-long railroad track on which we, we put these, uh, these rocket sleds that grab onto the track and fire surplus. Uh, Nike, Nike motors on the back to accelerate it up to about 300 miles an hour. And the reason we do that is to simulate the dynamic pressure that these devices will see at Mars. We get the, the uh, rho v squared, or actually the, the, the CD rho v squared duplicated so we get the same loads on the side that inflates around the vehicle. Here's a slow motion view of the thing accelerating down the track. And there's the deployment of the SIAD into the flow. This is, a, again, a, a very uh, you know, high-speed video. You can see it deploying very, very nicely, symmetrically, coming out to full inflation. Um, it then gets to, uh, gets to full speed and shows very rigid behavior. And so this is the test we did on the ground before we flew it supersonically at altitude. Testing the parachute, we have a similar, uh, not actually, well, using the same track anyway at China Lake, we have a, another uh, architecture for testing our parachutes. For this one, we want to pull the parachute down instead of sideways. Turns out if you pull parachutes sideways near the ground, they get ripped up. So we pick it up with a helicopter and carry it over the rocket sled track on a very long rope, about a 3,000-foot-long uh, uh, Technora rope. And that rope is then goes through a pulley to a rocket sled on the track. And so the rocket sled goes sideways, the pulley goes, uh, has the rope going up to the parachute and pulls the parachute down. And so there's the rocket sled. The, this bullet goes into here, which activates the rockets. The rockets fire. It then pulls hard on the parachute, pulls down with 100,000 pounds, 120,000 pounds of force to test the parachute again at the right dynamic pressure conditions. Um, there's the crew in the uh, control room allowing it, to, allowing it to fire. And then the parachute settles to the ground. On some of our tests and other tests, it's, we have more interesting descents. Um, on this one, you can see actually we got a tear in the parachute that showed us where there was a flaw in the, in the design or manufacture of the parachute. We were able to address that. As we go through, a lot of the parachute development tends, tends to be a bit trial and error on, uh, on developing these things and getting them to be able to survive the conditions. So then we go to uh, our, what we call our big kahuna test. This is done out in Kauai. At, off of the Pacific Missile Range Facility on the west end of Kauai. It's a great facility out there. And we use a, a large uh, uh, 33 million, 34 million cubic foot balloon, helium balloon, um, that is used normally for scientific payloads, for telescopes. Um, this is launched from a special tower that we developed uh, to allow it to be launched without people nearby. And this thing picks up our 7,000 pound test vehicle, which simulates a Mars lander. It looks, looks a lot like the Mars lander, at least on the bottom side. Um, it's actually 4.7 meters in diameter uh, compared to the 4.5 meter MSL vehicle. This balloon carries it up to about 120,000 feet altitude. Um, this is our control room out at uh, PMRF for operating the vehicle. There's the balloon launched and aloft. This is what it looks like when it gets filled up at altitude with the 34 million cubic feet of helium. And there's our test vehicle underneath it. And now about two hours later, we are at 120,000 feet, but that's not high enough. We need to get up to about 180,000 feet or 200,000 feet to do our test. Two, get in the right condition. One. So we fire a large wow. Star 48 rocket motor in the vehicle. And so we drop the vehicle from the balloon. It fires spin-up motors to stabilize the vehicle before the Star 48 fires. Star 48 fires for about 70 seconds. This gets the vehicle up to 180,000 feet, actually in this case 200,000 feet, and up to Mach 4. So we accelerate very quickly in a minute from 0 to Mach 4, 120 to 200,000 feet. The de-spin motors then fire to spin the vehicle down so we get it more, like more flight-like as to what the parachute would be deployed in. There's the balloon going by. The balloon gets destroyed by the, uh, by the drop of the vehicle. It ascends very rapidly, which is good. We then, it then goes into the water and we recover it so we don't leave a bunch of plastic in the ocean. So then the, as, the, as the vehicle is continuing to fire uh, and accelerating up, accelerates up in altitude, 
Um, I don't know if you can hear the sound, but one interesting thing we notice is the sound starts getting quieter and quieter as you go into thinner and thinner air. Um, vehicle is, uh, um, continues to fire, and so just continue to watch the spin and don't get dizzy. And then the, uh, the spin-down spin motors were great. The thing stopped on a dime, basically, uh, when we fired the spin-down motors. And now it's ready to deploy the SIAD. So we have on this vehicle a SIAD and a parachute on the same vehicle. The camera lens opens up. There it goes. You can see how rapidly the SIAD deploys. It's now at Mach, that was at Mach 4. Uh, and it worked very well, very stably, and it did not uh, affect the dynamics of the vehicle hardly at all. In fact, it stabilized the vehicle a little bit. Um, and it, it, showed, it showed itself as being very rigid. Uh, we had uh, measurements inside, laser measurement, uh, LED measurements inside with a camera to measure the deflection. We now put out another technology which I haven't talked about, which is a balut, um, which is used mainly to pull the parachute out, but it's a, itself a 4.4 meter supersonic balut that gets deployed at Mach 2.7. This shows some of our high speed video that we took of it. Um, you see that thing going out. It also has air inlets like the SIAD. -E. And so it goes out, and now it's, once its lines get cut, it pulls out the, ooh, look at that. Uh, pulls out the parachute, and so there's our 30-meter parachute, which is now mostly confetti um, from, that, from that first test, and I'll talk a little bit about that. The, uh, uh, here's the vehicle coming down. The side is deflated in the higher pressure atmosphere as we descend down to the ocean. On that, uh, what's left of that parachute, turned out it still provided enough drag to stably uh, bring the vehicle down to the ocean. Hit hard, but we were able to recover it. There's the parachute in the water. Uh, we were able to pull the parachute out and be able to examine it. Um, uh, there it is underwater, it looks like, kind of like a big jellyfish. And there's our uh, EOD guy sitting on the test vehicle floating in the water. We call this our supersonic space boat. It was designed to float um, on the water so that we could recover it. This is the uh, camera mast from which the flight image recorder has already been removed. This is the spent Star 48 motor. These guys are waiting for the big boat to come pick it up. Uh, and, and it did uh, successfully get uh, taken out of the water along with the parachute, along with, and there's the, the vehicle being taken out of the water by the crane onto the boat. It was brought back to the dock in Kauai, and we brought it back and uh, disassembled the vehicle and recovered the SIAD, the parachute, and all of the onboard data. There they are bringing the parachute on board. So, um, that, that was our, what we called SFDT-1. That was our first supersonic flight dynamics test. That was last June, um, and uh, around the end of last June. We have another test coming up in less than a month. We, our launch period opens on June 2nd. That first test was actually a shakeout test of the vehicle. The basic requirement was that we show that that test vehicle, that effectively that test bed, could actually get the technologies to the proper speeds and altitudes, collect all of the data, and bring the data back. It was optional for us to put on a parachute or a side, but we were able to get those ready in time. We got them on board, and we're very happy we did. Um, the side, in fact, was proven out. It's now at TRL-6 based on that first flight, which, is, which was just a shakeout flight. Um, and also, for the parachute, we were able to see a failure of the parachute, and we're, we're very glad to see that early. We wouldn't want to, we'd rather not see that parachute later in the program when we have less schedule to respond to it. So we now have addressed those failures. Uh, we, we understand to some extent um, uh, what happened in that, and we certainly know how to try and uh, make the parachute more robust, which we have to that. And now we have our real run for the record uh, coming up in this June, uh, where we, we're going to be uh, flying our, our actual flight design parachute, which is the ring sail and uh, bringing that up to conditions along with the SIAD to provide with a proper forebody and run those tests, and we're going to do it again next year. And so all these technologies are, are, are coming along well. The SIAD -E also was recently tested, and unfortunately I couldn't show the video for that. I have this fantastic video, but it has, wasn't cleared yet by the Navy uh, for, for public release, so, um, uh, so I'll try and catch, catch you guys later with that one. Uh, but the SIAD's also done its rocket sled run, and, and it worked fantastic, though we no noticed an interesting behavior on that one. Um, so we're developing these technologies. They're going to provide us with, uh, with uh, assuming we are successful in the tests and the parachutes uh, work well and we get the data that we want, the supersonic dynamics data and the, the flight characteristics. Um, these will be qualified for use for a flight project to pick up at a comparable risk uh, to its other technologies and get us up to two-ton or three-ton payloads on Mars. Also to, uh, to be able to put larger amounts of propellant in the vehicle uh, to allow us for, to do pinpoint landing and also provide us with higher altitudes at Mars to get more surface coverage, as Michelle was referring to. So that's it. Thank you. And I did it with three seconds to spare. So. <laughs> Is the remote up there? Hmm? The remote? Yeah, there is still there. Okay. All right. If I can get my... All right. I'm Josh Press with SpaceX. Very excited to be here and give a little bit of the commercial perspective and just talk about what we've been doing. We. Yeah, obviously, what's been in the news lately is a lot of what we're doing in LEO. We're trying to make launch less expensive um, by making boosters far less expensive to manufacture and also make them reusable. We've also been working on capsules, so we've been you know, 
building vehicles with heat shields, and now we're trying to go to the next generation of capsules with propulsive landing. Um, so the first slide, I, the, the next thing I've got is actually a video. So if you can bring the, the, the lights down. And just before I switch over to it, the, the first part of uh, making our launch vehicles reusable that we worked on was trying to figure out a way to land the booster. And so we started out doing tests with a vehicle we called Grasshopper, which is a vertical and takeoff and landing platform um, using one of our first stage engines. It's a very large vehicle. It's a, uh, the early version of Grasshopper was over 110 or over 100 feet tall. We followed it up with a vehicle called F9R, which is about 130 feet tall, um, doing vertical takeoff and landing tests in Texas. So. And this one goes up about 740 meters. Again, the, the takeoff portion of the test is really just to get us high enough to prove out the descent portion to do the landing. Early on, we looked at different ways of getting a booster back, and the first few Falcon 9s we flew actually had parachutes on them, and uh, we were hoping that they'd survive re-entry and then be able to deploy parachutes. We ended up realizing with time that it was, to put a heat shield on that would make the first stage actually survive re-entry would make it far too heavy and, and too inefficient, and so we had to use propulsive technologies to, to bring it back in and then to land it. We looked at making launch very inexpensive, you have to make the vehicle rapidly reusable. And if you're using parachutes and landing in the ocean, it's a way to get hardware back and inspect it. It's not really a way to turn something around very quickly and reuse it. So if you look, you can see the black spot on the pad that we took off from and where we land relative to it, um, kind of demonstrating initially some of the, the precision that, that we've been developing. Now, the, the next slide um, was the, the more challenging part that we went on to, which was demonstrating our being able to actually survive re-entry. And so we worked to reignite our, our, one of our, three of our first stage engines to do the re-entry burn, um, followed by a coast down to the, to the water and then a, a landing burn. This is the first decent video that, that we got from a, a mission. Unfortunately, the, uh, the land size is over, so the video uh, goes out fairly early on. But fortunately, we were able to do these tests as part of operational missions. Um, we had, for this mission, it was an Orbcom, a mission for a customer called Orbcom, where we actually launched six small LEO satellites for them. And after the first stage had completed its primary mission, we were able to shut it down, let the second stage fire and get well clear, and then reignite the first stage and do the rest of this demonstration, which made it relatively inexpensive for us to do this demonstration work. We followed up doing it on a few more missions. The mission after this was a, a cargo resupply mission for NASA, where uh, we were actually able to get some, uh, some better data. We've done it a number of times since then. The, the, uh, the last, actually two missions ago when we tried, there was some video that was kind of all over the internet showing us nearly landing on a barge, but, but not quite. Um, but keep on keeping making steps in the right direction. All right, if you can bring the lights back up. So just one more note about the supersonic retropropulsion. Um, again, we, we developed it because we're primarily interested right now in getting, getting our stages back, so bringing it back into the atmosphere. Um, however, SpaceX as a company you know, is interested in making access to LEO less expensive, but it's with the end goal of making access to Mars much less expensive. Um, Kind of our fundamental belief is if it still costs you a tremendous amount of money to get meaningful payload into LEO, you're never going to get large numbers of people onto Mars. Um, somewhat fortunately, the technologies we need to develop to bring a booster back and to bring a capsule back to Earth and make it rapidly usable are also necessary for landing very heavy payloads on Mars. So uh, we partnered with NASA to collect some data on our, on our um, supersonic retropropulsion because um, as was mentioned in one of the earlier presentations, the conditions where we reignite our first stage are similar to what, where you'd ignite uh, a lander for, for Mars. Um, and again, the, the stage that we're landing right now is, is quite a large vehicle. It's 12 feet in diameter. It's about 130 feet tall, probably weighs 50 or 60,000 pounds. So it's 
it's you know, kind of on the same scale as, as is talked about for, for human landers in, in the future on Mars. Um, so the previous couple of charts were talking about the kind of tech development. Now we're trying to operationalize this, this whole system of, of entry, descent, and, and landing on Earth. Um, again, the, uh, the picture on the left is taken from the, the mission two flights ago where we were flying a cargo resupply mission for NASA and nearly landed on the barge. We came down just a little bit hard. But if you look, that's a picture over the barge. The barge is about the same size as a football field, so 160 feet wide, 300 feet long. Um, and we're trying to land within kind of a 10 meter, meter box on, on the barge. If you think we're taking off from the Cape, we're flying a couple hundred miles downrange and trying to, trying to land within a 10 meter box, um, that's fairly good precision. We have the benefit of doing it on Earth where we have GPS, which obviously is not available presently on Mars. Um, so other technologies will be needed. But this is starting to put together bits and pieces and, and create a database um, that will help with the eventual um, entry, descent, and landing on Mars. Um, another system that we're working on we're, is, our, is our capsule, which initially all of our reentry was done with the blade of heat shields, um, which were developed really in, large part thanks to our friends at NASA Ames who helped us understand how PICA was developed. We did our own variant of it and used it on the Dragon capsules um, and have used those for the several missions of Dragon so far. With Dragon, as we go to the future, we want to make it land propulsively um, on Earth, which uh, as we look at, at similar sized vehicles in the future where there's concept of possibly using those same propulsion systems as part of the uh, entry, descent, and landing on a, on a Mars mission as well. Um, the picture that you see on the right is actually from yesterday when we did the first static fire of the fully integrated system. And then earlier this morning, we did our first abort test where the engines fired for just a few seconds. We ended up getting about a mile of altitude and then uh, parachutes deploy and we landed offshore. Um, so this, this is a rapidly developing system as well. Again, w our hope is to use these same engines so for now, initially, they're an abort engine for, for crewed missions. But longer term, if the propellant's not used for an abort maneuver, we want to use it for a landing maneuver to give us precision landing on this, on this smaller vehicle as well. Um, one kind of key thing about the engines that are, are depicted on the left and that are firing on the right is they're hypergal engines on the order of 15, 16,000 pounds of thrust, um, but they're fully printed engines, which makes them very inexpensive to produce as well. And so we're addressing the, the, the cost component of these systems. Because um, again, if, if we can make something that's reusable but insanely expensive, we really haven't done anything. If we make something that's semi-affordable but expendable, we also don't do it. We really want to look at, at these systems as kind of you know, airplane-like operations where you land, refuel, and refly. Um, and that leads to, the, again, the, the design of propulsive landing for the capsule. Because again, if you land with parachutes in the ocean, you end up the nice salt water bath, which isn't exactly great for the system, um, or for the booster, if you land it with parachutes, you end up with a similar salt water bath. And for a number of reasons, um, that makes it really not a, a reasonable system either. So that's all I had for, for comments. Um, and so I guess I look forward to the questions from the audience. When I sat down at this table, I didn't know what I was going to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it would be about entry, descent, and landing, and it will. Interesting sound that happened there. Um, are you getting that? The little uh, shaker that happens every time I talk? OK, cool. Let's roll with it. Um, but uh, you've, you have seen from the panel an array of different technologies, really in two families, propulsive and aerodynamic. Uh, that solve some of the, what is fundamentally an energy management problem that we have when we go to land on Mars in particular. And when we start thinking about landing very big things on Mars, um, we start talking about which of these technologies are, are best or, or which of the sub-species um, of the families of technologies, what kind of parachute or what kind of rocket fuel um, so the point I'm going to take, what I'm going to talk about is going to riff off of that question, but I'm going to start it with a story of MSL, the Curiosity rover, and its landing system. 
Um, in the spring of 2003, MSL was an actual project. It had money, it had a goal, it had level one requirements, it had a big rover, and we didn't know how to land it. And under the pressure of that requirement to land the rover, we, um, we had a we had a plan, and we were assessing that plan, but eventually we confirmed that, that that technique, which had been what we called the pallet lander, it was, think of a six-legged lander that allowed itself to belly flop. We were really trying to solve the stability problem that we had um, been concerned about after the loss of the Mars Polar Lander mission in 99, late 99, early uh, 2000. We eventually uh, um, had to let go of the lander because of the of the pallet lander because we we're, we were uh, stymied with protecting the propulsion system from rock strike and the mass cost of that. Simultaneously, we were looking at another technology of seeing if there was any way that we could use airbags to do the final cushioning of Curiosity's landing. We'd used them successfully for MER the Spirit and Opportunity, and we used them successfully for the little Sojourner rover and Pathfinder. But we couldn't. We couldn't on two ways. We couldn't in the mass scaling, it doesn't scale very well, and we couldn't, frankly, because we couldn't get fibers strong enough to keep bags together under the 900 kilos of, of Curiosity's uh, landing. So in the fall, in the Indian summer, uh, September, of 2003, we gathered everybody back together um, who had experience, and we did a brainstorming session for a couple of days, and we came out with, with the sky crane. Now, I tell you that story because it was really only because we had to do the job that we were pushed hard enough to test hard enough and find the limits of the pieces of technology and make the tough choices, including, by the way, choosing the sky crane. The sky crane is not easy to love. At first inspection, it looks a little weird and crazy. In fact, we had to come to DC, to NASA headquarters, and we had to talk in front of the administrator who started the discussion by saying, when I heard what these guys were doing, I said it was crazy, and they had to come here and explain to me why they were doing such a crazy thing. So you only get pushed into the final solution by the imminent threat of having to do a thing. And so um, I think we should be focusing on, the, on a strategy to get us as close to that imminent threat of doing a thing as possible. Now, um, yesterday morning, or this morning? This morning, I think, maybe Farooz Naderi uh, talked about something called the Affordable Mars Architecture, which is a particular architecture that, that, uh, that his team has put together about how to fit within um, the current NASA funding wedge and actually get progress. Now, whether that architecture that was described is the right one or not, I'd love to debate, but I feel very strongly that choosing a path forward that can conceivably fit within the um, resources that we have is the only way that we will be brought to proximity of doing that real thing, forced into that intimate um, relationship with the act of doing that will push us to the position to down-select from this array of beautiful technologies we have and choose something that doesn't actually have to even be the best thing that will actually get the job of human exploration of Mars done. Well, that's, I'll leave it with that. Thank you. So thank you, panel. Um, I, I just want to brag on these guys a little bit. You've seen videos, you've seen hardware. These guys are making things happen. That is exciting. We've, we've heard a couple of times this week about 
we're not just talking about plans on paper anymore for architectures to Mars. We're making things happen that are actually taking those steps that are going to get us there. And that's exciting to me. So um, I'm hoping that you have all been generating lots of questions in your minds as we, as we have been hearing from these, uh, these panel members. Now's the time when you get to ask them. So use the microphones down front here and uh, address the panel and have at it. Right, for my, for my inflatables, the supersonic inflatables, we have not looked at foam filling. Uh, the gas actually does, does the job that we need. I don't know, if Michelle, if you know, if, the, if Neil or any of those guys have looked at foam for the Yes, triad. so for hypersonic inflatable aerodynamic decelerators, we have not um, thoroughly investigated, um, but one of the um, challenges we have that we're going to be studying in the next, you know, few months is are gas generators really the right solution for a a larger scale system. So, you know, gas generators are fine for a three meter RV flight test, but are they the most efficient, effective method for a 20 meter high ed that you need for human scale? So, I think that's something we want to consider on our list. Thank you. We'll, we'll look at that. We can hear you. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> So, may I? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Start with the second one first, and the first one second. Um, uh, robotic missions, historic robotic missions, um, let's call it 80 kilogram meter squared ballistic coefficients. Um, human scale missions like Apollo, 300 to 700. Landing a house, maybe it'll be 1,000. That should be the range of ballistic coefficients, a kilogram meter squared. Um, uh, in terms of reactive, uh, we are, we did, when we landed um, Curiosity, we kind of, we used the drag force and the lift force, which is the atmosphere doing work on us, um, to move us around. So we, we got, got that, we, we moved around within the atmosphere or within a perturbation around our nominal trajectory without using our own motive forces to do that but just steering the, um, the drag and lift for the aerodynamic forces. 
Yeah, I, 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 know, I, I know where you're going, and the second law of thermodynamics is working against you in that one, in general. I mean, I'm not saying you can't do it. You know, hybrid vehicles do it all the time. But um, it, it is hard, especially when it's heat that you're trying to harvest. Hi, I'm curious, how do you guys collaborate? Like, do you ever get together and just totally share ideas about EDL? No, we, we like, I mean, I, you're watching time. video after video after video. Do you, like, get together for beers, like, every month and go, oh, we tried this thing and that thing, and you really should try launching this thing this way or landing that thing? Are they really, are they comparable, comparable? Like, is there collaboration? We do get together for beers. Sector? That's true. <laughs> we do. Um, not as regularly as we should. Correct. That's also true. Um, but I would say at least... Some of us, Mark, Michelle, and myself, well, I see Mark all the time, but um, Michelle and I see each other once every couple months, once a month-ish kind of stuff. Yeah. Do we collaborate as best as we could? Probably not, yeah. but that's true about all humans. So we, we do have, I mean, EDL efforts do go across a bunch of centers, as was talked about earlier. You know, we have, we, we, we have support from Ames for the aerothermal, from Langley for aerodynamics and aerodynamic databases and other kinds of testing. Um, at JPL, we do a lot of the systems work. We have support from Marshall for propulsion systems. There's a lot of different support across NASA mm -hmm. involved in putting together a team that can actually do an entry, descent, and landing system. It does take effort, right? It's uh, like even with Morpheus, we had eight different centers, but it takes yeah. effort to go get all those people involved, and uh, it's an effort that's well worth the, mm -hmm. worth the pursuit. And when we are so together, we it's perfectly harmonious. Yeah, always. <laughs> That's one of the best parts. <laughs> and I, I would mention that um, the entry, descent, and landing community is kind of a grassroots community, and we're kind of recognized as one of the models across the agency for a multi-center effort and a multi-mission directorate effort. So, um, you know, we're definitely, we could do some improvements in some areas, um, but we are, I think we actually work together very well. Afternoon. I'm a little curious. You showed a lot of interesting work on drag decelerator systems. Uh, there is, of course, another approach to entry, uh, which is high lift systems, which give you some advantages. Uh, I do remember back in the old Case for Mars days in the previous century, uh, there was a lot of talk about bent biconic uh, entry vehicles. I don't think anybody thinks about those anymore. Uh, but I'm just curious if you've looked into any uh, lift based. Uh, Systems. Oh, you were showing one. So yeah, yeah I guess I'll take that one first, and everybody else can jump in. Um, so as I mentioned, you know, the mid L over D vehicles up to L over D of you know 0 0.7, 0 0.8 have been looked at in the past design reference architectures, um, and it's still you know in our list of alternatives now. When you get higher than that, um, the packaging becomes a, a difficulty or a challenge. Um, we're wondering again how to. Um, transition from the hypersonic decelerator to the supersonic retropropulsion as well. Um, and so we, uh, the study we're embarking on right now, um, there are some proponents of higher lift systems. And so we're gonna you know, work down the, the trade path and see what the deficiencies are in uh, the lower lift systems and where we need more performance. So, you know, one thing we need to be careful about is adding complexity for complexity's sake if we don't need that extra performance. Yeah, there's a lot of system issues that go into it, and so it's going to be a question, to, and I think it's totally on the table to have L over Ds of around 0.5 or 0.6 or so. Um, but there's, of course, packaging issues. You know, how do you change the configuration? How do you get stuff out of it and so on that, that would have to be worked out and see if it's worth those system trays. I don't know if you can do much better than that. I think the shuttle hypersonically had an L over D of about 1. Um, and so it's, that's probably about the limit where you can go, and you're at you know, 0.5 or 0.6 or maybe 0.7, as Michelle was saying, that you've gotten most of that benefit. So I think we are going to be considering those kind of systems along with the, the 0.2 or 0.3 that we're using now. This is a non-technical question. Uh, you all appear to be the age where your children or grandchildren might have an opportunity to ride in one of these vehicles. Would that you hurt. be overjoyed? I know you weren't talking to me. <laughs> <laughs> Please. 
please. I'm sorry. Continue. Could you repeat yeah. the question? <laughs> Don't listen to I think it's enough of a challenge for our children just to drive cars. <laughs> <laughs> Much That's less. That's what I'm thinking. No, would you? How do you feel? How do you feel about the risk factor? Would you be pleased to find out that your children are going to be among the first Mars colonists or first Mars landers? Sure, but I consider that it's a strong possibility that I might not see them again. I mean, you know, that's, it's certainly going to be risky to go to Mars no matter what. I mean, you know, the, the kinds of energies and, and, and things that you're doing and durations and the systems you're going to depend on, for recycling systems, whatever, for your, for your well-being, um, it's, it's no question that there's going to be big risk in sending people to Mars. But, of course, it's, it would be a great honor to do that. You know, you've got to think about how we can spend your life. Well, you're going to die eventually anyway. That might be one good way to do it. So if my children wanted to do that, I'd go, good luck. I, I have a different it. opinion. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, it's just the obvious one, which is hell no. Um, <laughs> just because of the risk exposure. People didn't come back when they started out from Europe to America. That's, That's right. true. Uh, that didn't mean they were dead. And you know, I think well, <laughs> that is also true. <laughs> but but it, it's true that the, that the the first people who went in boats over the horizon on average died. And so it's not actually this exploration thing that we do, oh, great, fun. This exploration thing we do is a great argument for um, uh, group selection because it doesn't necessarily seem to be advantageous for the individual, but as a whole, it is advantageous for us as a species. So I'm awesomely happy if Mark's kids want to go. <laughs> 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 yeah, mine are more expendable, so that's <laughs> So most of you there know me. Hi, Rod. Well, I You're not allowed Come to ask Come sit. <laughs> so so th chair. this is really an uh, interesting uh, dialogue I have my, myself. He's not going to so, ask a question, is he? So I'm going to ask you <laughs> to, to help me with this. Uh, how do we get public-private partnership especially things that we do very unique. Uh, TPS is one area where I work on, and oftentimes I'm asked, what is it useful other than for space applications? But the way that I have gone about, at least some of you know, is to engage small industry as much as we can. Um, what do you think about the entire EDL portfolio when you look at it, how do we engage both not only SpaceX, but smaller industry, where are the opportunity space, especially when we look at a 40 year program? Or maybe now, you can. Is, your, is your question where are the opportunities for small business profit within the. Or how do we engage them in things that we do that are very unique? You know? So I think his point is that EDL is one of those technologies that's not quite as pervasive among the commercial sector, yeah. it, you know, planetary entry and landing is something so far that has mostly been a NASA thing and, and hopefully our commercial partners will, will be help in that, that game and help us. Uh, I'm but really I, glad SpaceX is, uh, mm -hmm. you know, their vision is Mars. Right. So that helps us. Absolutely. You know, and whereas when we look at each of these technologies that we are pulling together and there are various ways in which to cross section them and see where private industry could help us too. That's what we are trying to do. But in, you know, are there things that you see? So there's, that, there's, there's yeah. pieces, right? That you, you, I don't think, I don't know of anything that's, that cuts across, right, EDL. But there's pieces where you can try to look for those partnerships. There's already a, within AES, the Advanced Exploration Systems, and NASA has a Catalyst program that they just started in the past year. Catalyst is, is actually to work with small commercial companies to try to enhance their landing capability. It's lunar focused at this point, but it's to help them build commercial lander capability for, for lunar uh, missions. And so that's heading in that direction of uh, public-private partnerships to, to engage those capabilities. And I think as John started with, uh, there are a lot of component technologies that we can um, engage uh, industry, small business uh, to develop and maybe, you know, NASA or some of the larger corporations maintain the integration function. Uh, but, you know, uh, Raj has been very instrumental in getting um, a small weaving company, textile manufacturer, involved in producing 
thermal protection system materials. So we've taken a very terrestrial type of industry and applied it to aerospace. On the flip side, you know, we've uh, been developing thermal protection systems for the HIAD that are flexible and packable, and it turns out those might be very applicable to uh, fire tents to protect our firefighters against flame-on conditions in the future. So it actually goes both ways um, where we can transfer uh, some of these components back and forth. Let's give a little bit of the downside. The, <clears throat> it's, it, we don't fly these missions very often. And so, you know, it's, it's sometimes difficult to get a, a business who wants, you know, that wants to make profit uh, to do something that, you know, they might sell something once every six and a half years or so to do a, to do a Mars mission. So in order to really get their, their engagement, you have to have something more frequent, more frequent test opportunities, other, other things, and also depend on them to have other business lines that are similar to what you're doing um, in order to get them engaged in, in, in what's going on. Yeah, we call that sustainability, right? Right. How do you sustain these, tech, these companies or these industries for the right. long haul. And, and if you get one involved, you might find that they're not there six years later. Um, <laughs> so. Yes. All right, I believe that's our last question. Um, oh, he's got, we we got have one. one more. Oh, one more. I'm sorry about that. Um, uh, all right, okay. we'll, all right, we'll do two more, and then that's all. Uh, I'm just curious, the how, how does the uh, design process work in the context of, you know, the agency-wide effort, for example, uh, uh, design reference architecture. Uh, do, uh, so uh, I, what I'm guessing is that uh, uh, you would try to come up with uh, uh, EDL system uh, based on some kind of a representative numbers uh, for certain mission scenarios. But do you try to also influence uh, NASA's way of uh, designing, like for example, uh, for EDL, um, you might decide that uh, entry speed has to be as low as possible and therefore, like do you lobby for electric propulsion system where they can actually change the arrival velocity and so on? I just, uh, well, Yeah, so when one is putting together a mission, it, it, you, you, need to put the, you need to connect all the dots. And so when you're designing an EDL system, it's a multi-centered agency-wide design process. Um, and it usually uses the um, constraints of the interplanetary trajectory as givens. Um, if you are in this weird thing that we're doing with human scale missions, because we're sort of architecting something that is over the horizon time-wise, so you're also now able to influence to try and change the boundary conditions of the arrival state, you might do that. It ends up being not that big of a deal. It's actually a disadvantage to arrive too slowly. But, um, but, uh, but yes, you can, and yes, and we do. Yeah, so that's why we're really very integrated with the human architecture team. And so we have experts from all the different disciplines across the centers, and so, um, you know, everybody collectively, after working together for, you know, months and years, um, becomes familiar with the constraints and the kind of the, the hard points and the challenges that one architecture element imposes on another. Um, and then, you know, as you alluded to, we can bring in actually new ideas that might break some of the old paradigms. For instance, you know, the introduction of solar electric propulsion is changing the way we used to think about the 26 month launch constraints and the synodic cycle. So, you know, now we know that those are um, more flexible with the solar electric propulsion stage. So that's one example of how new technologies can kind of shift our paradigms a little bit. So it's been my experience that EDL is on the short end of the stick you're talking about. We, you know, we get the requirements and have to somehow come up yep. with a way, and then we find out that they you know, miss their margins and we have to do better. Um, and then the guys say, well, we want a shorter trip Poor time, so we're going to have a higher entry velocity. And we say, okay. You know, that's the usually the way it goes, right. Again. <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. I'd like to maybe end with the following uh, uh, statement. <laughs> um, <laughs> Not to supersede Andrew or anything. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you can say something after I'm done if you would like. <laughs> um, but uh, no, I would just like to, on that, offer this observation. I think we have in our hands today more technology to put a human being on Mars than we had the technology to put a human on the moon and return them safely when John F. Kennedy said we'll do it in a decade. So I don't think it's a question of technology, it's a question of will. And that's why it's important for us to try and make the required will dollars as little as possible so we can just get the job done. All right, let me thank our panel members, if you'll join me. I, I, I know a few of them have a schedule to meet, so they may be disappearing quickly, but some of them may be able to stick around a little longer after we uh, adjourn here. But, um, so we are finished, and thank you again for your participation. Thank you, everybody. And those of you going to the reception tonight at 6 o'clock, you should in your packets have a map to get to the Sun Trust Building. Thank you very much.